Welcome to our Comic Corner, our gateless comic oasis. My name is Damon Gray. I am joined alongside today. If you are a fan of the Agents of Fandom, you will know AF, who is a fellow agent of mine. AF, welcome to your Comic Corner debut. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, been long in the making. Um, yeah, I've, I've wanted to be on the show for a while. And yeah, what better way than to to be on with the artist of... Uh, that that I've been looking up to for for so long, and I, I really love this guy's work. Uh, yeah, over to you, Damon, to to do the introductions. Well, let's get this underway. We have Sean Isaacs today. He is an artist. We have never had an artist here on the Comic Corner before. It was something I was really pushing for, and we finally got one. Sean, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Like it's always good to. Uh you know, make new friends, get to talk about my work. And uh, yeah, thanks for in inviting me, man. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Sean, you are an artist on the new Green Arrow series coming out in April. You've done plenty of covers, plenty of variant covers. But I want to know, first and foremost, your comic book origin story, per se. How did you get into this world? Oh man, um, I don't think there's enough time on the show for me to go through all of it. I'll try and I'll try and I'll try and give you the the abridged version. Um, like I've always I've always wanted to do comic books since I was since I was a kid. I've got I've got pictures that I drew on my my mother's cigarette boxes of you know Superman, Spider Man, and Batman. Those were like the three that I was sitting and trying to draw, and most of the time they were just like squiggles. You know, Superman had the S the wrong way around. Batman was just this like black blob with like a yellow circle in the middle uh spidey was sort of you know like just like cross uh, you know like norse and crosses kind of thing but it was all red with like a little black squiggle in the middle like that kind of stuff uh so i've always wanted to do comics and um uh i you know like i, I did art in high school and i was the, i was those those that kid that was like sitting at the back of the class with the book open but he, he was reading like an x-men comic in the middle kind of thing and that's why i i got like i got like double g for maths you know for math um like it was like you know it was like teacher, teacher just saying like ah oh, good game good game like let's try like it, it wasn't my strong suit <laughs> um but um, the plan originally was that after school, I like my family wasn't wealthy or anything like I didn't have a lot of uh, spending money. And so, you know, my, my idea after high school was to try and get a job as a um, camp counselor um, during, during, you know, summer in the States. And then during the off season, just sort of try and go to all the cons so I can submit my work because I mean, we didn't have the internet back then. Um, and I'd applied for a job as a camp counselor to like teach art to kids and all that kind of stuff. And over here back then, you know, like they would submit your uh, portfolio over overseas to, you know, the head of the camps and they would go over it and you'd hear back like months later. Right. <clears throat> and um, so what happened was I, I did that and then they were going to have like an open day on the Saturday you know, where they could, they would hire you literally on the spot. You know, you just have to make a good impression. And, and I was like, okay, I got this, I got this, got this down, no problem. So that was, that was supposed to be the Saturday. And on the Thursday, uh, my father came home and he was like, I've got lung cancer. Can you please take over the family job? Um, and just looked after everybody while I'm, I try to get better. So that never happened. So I ended up, you know, taking over this really other job, which was a whole lot of other stories and stuff. And I ended up working there for like two years while my father went through chemo and surgery and all that kind of stuff. So eventually I went through a whole bunch of other jobs after that. Um, you know, uh, I would work, work during the day. I worked at a little, a little CD, you know, retail shop, you know, selling CDs and DVDs and movies and music and stuff. And in the evenings I put myself through um, like graphic design college. So, you know, I'd, I'd go for, from work, I didn't finish work at six, rush through to college, stay there until about nine in the evening, come back home and do homework. Um, and I did that for about a year. And then after that, I ended up working in graphic design for like two years. No, I worked in graphic design for five years at the one place and three years at the next place. And then I got, uh, we, we lost, our, I lost my job. Basically, the company was downsizing and they like got rid of like 20 people in the course of like a week. 
um, and lost my job. And like by then, I just thought to myself, um, you know, like obviously, you when people get retrenched, they lose their job, they get upset. Um, I'm I generally try to be an optimistic person and look on the bright side of things and just try and stay positive and spread positivity to people. And um, I was like, you know, this is maybe maybe this is the universe telling me I'm wasting my time and I should you know take this opportunity to do what I love doing, which is drawing comic books. Um, so I left. I mean, you know, I, well, I didn't leave. They, they, you know, let us go. And um, you know, from there, I started doing whatever I could just to draw stuff and try and work on comics and that. And um, it took, like, I was drawing all sorts of things for about a year before I started getting a steady income. Um, and then, and even then, the steady income I was getting was from, uh, you know, commercials. I would do like storyboards for commercials and all that stuff, and uh, that helped me like pay the bills. And, um, you know, during that time, I started working with uh, uh, my buddy uh, Vito Del Sante on our creator own book, which was uh, Stray. Um, and we managed to successfully kickstart like the first volume of that, which we're very proud of. Um, but sort of while that happened, um, during that time period, where I was trying to just find work, I ended up working like finding online a uh, an online comic which sort of made fun of comics it was called it was, i don't know if you're familiar it's called gutters and so what gutters did was they they'd look for like the biggest thing happening that week in comics and sort of make like a parody of it and like sort of make a joke of it and i saw that oh they were paying and i was like oh so i can get some cash in at least and i submitted stuff and they came and they said okay cool uh we want you to do two pages for us so one page was um the human torch had just died and so that it was a parody on the fact that he, of him dying and it basically was just this this one page this one page comic of him dying and meeting um you know uh uncle ben um in heaven being like ah i've been here the whole time like don't worry about it you'll probably be back down there in like no time you know but like the only person that never comes back is uncle ben um and then the next page i ended up doing for them was one when um when bucky was capped for a while and then Steve came back and Bucky had to give the shield back to back to Steve. And so in the comic, like you see Steve is like, oh, okay, cool. I'm, I'm here. I'm here for the shield again. And Bucky's like, oh, here's your shield. And then he turns around and he starts running away. And Kat, uh, and Steve is like, he like, he like runs his finger across it. And there's like this line. And he's like, this is a cake, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I did the two pages for a minute. That's the only time they asked me for stuff. Um, but the editor at Gutter's, probably again my my sense of time is actually quite terrible during that period because this is this all kind of happens over the course of about six years um he eventually got a job working at dynamite and you know like a year or so later he i get a message from him asking if i want to try out for a couple of comics in at uh, in at dynamite um the first one i tried out for was the dresden files which never happened because the the creator of the Dresden Files didn't feel my style fit what he wanted to do with the book, which is fair enough. Um, and probably good for me because I didn't know much about Dresden anyways, and I didn't know if I would really dig it myself. Um, but then like a month or so later, I got a message saying like, do I want to try out for um, the Pathfinder comic books? And at the time, like I'm, I'm a big D&D nerd as well. And so like, you know, every every second uh, Wednesday, I'm playing D&D with my friends. Back then, we were playing every Friday night, and we were playing the Pathfinder role-playing system. So I was like, oh, I know everything about Pathfinder. I've got all the, the role-playing books. I play with my buddies. Like, I'd love to be on this book. And so I managed to get get that gig and work on Pathfinder with Jim Zub. Um, and, I mean, this is also sort of when Stray came out. So I was working on Stray. I was working on Pathfinder um and that's when i met jim and you know i did like a good few issues for a couple of years on on pathfinder i finished the stray series uh, volume one we did a, a crossover stray did a crossover as well as an action verse and the whole thing there um and then like things kind of went quiet i just you know i was working on things here and there working on you know corporate comics uh storyboards still um and you know sort of during the course of that time i managed to get uh you know send some samples to the marvel talent uh talent you know management guys and uh, talent coordinators 
And like during the course of those six years, I think the talent coordinators changed like three times. So like the, the, good, the one guy would just pass me over to the next guy. Cause like I'd send them, you know, like two or three page samples and then they'd look at it and give me like a critique being like, oh, you're, you're zooming in really close so that you don't have to draw backgrounds, you know? And I'd be like, ah, oh, damn, you kind of busted me. Or they go, um, oh, your your Peter Parker looks like a different guy in every panel, so that's not cons- faces aren't consistent. So I'd have to go and work on that. So like, I wouldn't like send samples all the time, but I'd send like a sample and then like work on stuff for about six months and then send like another page samples and stuff. And eventually, I stopped sending samples because I was like, okay, I'm going to work on my comic books and the Pathfinder stuff, and I'm just going to practice while I do those. And then sort of when those were done, I sent some new samples in, you know. Um, and I think by third or fourth batch of samples um, was with uh, Ricky Purden, which is the current, current uh, talent coordinator at Marvel. And he was like, okay, cool, but I want to see you do some Marvel pages. So he gave me like a, a Spider Gwen script. And I started working on those. But at, as I started working on those, I got a whole lot of storyboard artwork from ad agencies and stuff so i was like really really busy like drawing those things because also like you know storyboard work is like very um it's very crunchy like they'll they'll come and say to you okay cool we want uh we want 50 50 boards and you have like three days to do it in kind of thing um so like i didn't have i didn't have time and like i keep on messaging ricky and being like hey i haven't forgotten i am working on these but like i'm i have to do work where i'm getting paid right now so uh, like just don't forget me and he was like he was super cool and he's like that's fine just you know whenever you get the chance just make sure it's your, the best work you can do and you can send it to us and that's fine and so it took me about about six months to do five pages uh for him because i was just i was just swamped and eventually i sent them to him um and it sort of turned out that like he he really liked it he passed it around he said like oh we really like these pages um but at the same time uh jim zub by then also who i worked with in pathfinder obviously he had now come into marvel and was doing work for them and he was writing thunderbolts at the time and he was like his artist needed a break um you know for a couple of issues and he he was like here's a couple of suggestions on who i think would be really cool for the book and i was one of those suggestions so it's like you know he was passing my name around Ricky was passing my name around my work. And I think like everybody was like, oh, okay, this guy's name is popping out. Let's, let's give him a shot. And that's when they offered me uh, Thunder, my first, like my first Marvel gig, which was Thunderbolt. Um, and that's sort of like the shortish version of uh, how I got my first, first gig at Marvel. Yeah. But no, no, like I said, like I said, it took six years. That whole thing was like six years from when I lost my job to when I got my first Marvel book out. It was about six years. Like, like knowing knowing that from a South African point of view, that's such a cool success success story. Um, because I mean, we we know how things go over here, and the fact that you uh, managed to uh, solidify uh, such such a cool gig um, from South Africa, uh, that's that's just so so great to you and so heartwarming uh, to you as well. Um, but just on the back of that, uh, in terms of communication. Uh, what sort of obstacles do you go through uh, sitting in South Africa, knowing that you have these deadlines? Uh, what's what's your communication like? You have the time difference. Uh, how do you deal with all of those things? Um, I mean, you know, I mean, as as a South African, you know that load shedding is our biggest obstacle. Really, it's like when power goes out. So, like, I ended up having like it, it was really affecting my work big time. Like, you know, being able to, you know, try and knock out eight eight to 10 hours of work, but I was only having ele- like electricity for like six hours a day. I ended up getting myself like a tablet and a pen. So like now at least when there's two to four hour gaps, um, I might not be able to do like the, the fine work. Um, uh, like my, like when I do my inks, I'm very like fussy with my line work when I'm doing inks, but on the tablet, I can do all my roughs. I can do thumbnails for like, you know, pages that I've got, I'm going to get to still. So like I can still, get work done now like um, before i got the tablet it was it was really really harsh um i'm i'm generally a night owl myself um so the time difference doesn't really affect me too much like i'll 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 stay up late usually anyways and then if i get mails i'll reply to them and stuff um i also like 
uh, when it comes to communication and stuff, I'm, I like to make editors, like editors have a lot of work, right? They're like juggling like 20 books and like countless talents that they have to now sort out and deadline and stuff. So I'm a very, I try to be a proactive uh, on the communication side. So if i um, so sometimes I'll work on like a page at a time and finish a page and knock it out and send it over. Sometimes I'll be like, okay, I need to switch this up and I'll work on like four pages at a time. So like, it'll, there'll be a few days where I won't be able to send anything because, you know, I've inked all the pay, all the characters on the pages and now I'm busy going back and doing all the backgrounds and stuff. And so if it goes too long, um, without me sending stuff, I, I'd say maybe three, four pages a week at most, um, then I'll be like, okay, I'm going to drop an email to the, to the editor. So that, like, they never feel, I don't want them to ever feel like they have to chase me up for info to see how I'm doing or where I'm at. Um, and I feel like that's one of the things that I kind of, uh, is why editors like working with me is because I let them, I let them know they don't have to send me an email. I'll be like, Hey guys, this is where I'm at. And I'll send them like, you know, JPEGs showing the work I've done so far, even though there's no finished pages. And I'll be like, this is what I've done just to let you know that I'm, I'm still, you know, hard at work and I'm not just like lazing around, um, you know, you know, not doing my work because a lot of, a lot of creatives, well, not a lot, but like sometimes creatives do that thing or certain creatives have that thing where it's like, oh shit, you know, I'm falling behind. Um, I'm just not going to talk to anybody until I'm done, you know? Um, and I found that when I'm, when I'm talking to editors and stuff, like if I tell them in advance, they can make plans like, you know, try and get me an extension or get another artist to help on pages and stuff. What they don't want is to like hear something last minute and then have to scramble to get things done. Um, so like communication wise is, you know, thankfully the internet, if the power's out, I can use my phone and, you know, uh, just, just let them know in advance, uh, you know, cause everybody's just kind of trying to get, get, to get by. And I mean, they've got big jobs to that. They've got to deal with. Um, and I mean, all I want to do is really just sit and draw. Right. Um, so yeah, I think I think that sort of answers the question, I guess. You mentioned the Thunderbolts run, and I really, really love that Thunderbolts run. Uh, Hawkeye is my one of my favorite, if not not no, Hawkeye is my favorite character, both Kate and Clint. And the designs that you go through, I am curious, especially going to this Green Lantern, uh, Green Arrow run too. What are you kind of looking at when it comes to designs for those characters? Are you trying to go something new something classic is it something that the writers tr give to you is it something that you come up with yourselves is it a almost like an agreement uh pre be like i'll show you something and you pick how does that work um so i'm i, I can get very cheeky with um with uh, uh, character designs though um oftentimes a, a right like a writer or, or an editor won't necessarily ask me for a new design but i'll do one anyway just because you know like i Cheekily, I want to put my my stamp on every character that I work on in some way, right? Um, so to give you an idea with with Clint, for example, um, like the the script or anything didn't require like a, a design or anything like that. Like you know, Jim came to me and he's like, he. So I I had just finished Fantastic Four Life Story and I was like completely burnt out from it. Like it was it was like a year and a half of like like some of the most difficult work I've had to do because while I was working on that was when I got COVID for the first time. And then like mm -hmm. the recovery from that, like I had it very harsh. I, I thought I wasn't going to make it. Uh, I lost a friend as well to like, who's, who's 10 years younger than me. He died from COVID. Right. Um, so like I, I, you know, the recovery period was really long and really slow. And so like I struggled on that book. Um, but then, you know, like after that, um, Jim was like, can I get, he went to uh, Tom Briefit and he was like, listen, can I get Sean on this? And uh, Tom was like, I don't know. He's just finished a, a team book now. I don't know if he's going to be up for it. And like, Jim was like, no, 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 I'll talk to him. It's fine. And the first thing Jim said to me was like, oh, Clint Barton's in it. And I'm like, damn it. Because he knew I'm a big Clint Barton fan, right? So he's like, I'm like, oh, okay, fine. I'll do it. Um, and I mean, I was still, I was still kind of burnt out while I was doing that book. That's why we need to get a little bit of help on that book. Um, and I said to him, I said, can I give, can I try and give Clint a new costume? He's like, well, we don't, I mean, we don't need it, but I mean, if you want, if you want to, so I'm like, no, no, that's fine. I'll do one. So I sat there and I like with Clint, especially with like, when, it, when I'm doing costume designs for characters, like I try to like get into their head, like what kind of, their, what's their style, what's their personality, what's their history. Um, 
and I like it Clint since since he showed up in in the Avengers movie um he's just been like in a t-shirt and jeans or a t-shirt and like black cargo pants or something like that and I was like no he's a superhero I want to I want to draw him as a superhero right and I thought like I wanted to create like this synergy between what we saw in the Hawkeye TV show, his costume that he has at the end of the show, um, but also kind of mesh some of his classic looks with some of his more modern looks. Um, and I sort of, you know, went through a couple of designs with that. And that's sort of how I came up with the design that he has in, in Thunderbolts. Like it's got like the purple stripe down the sleeves, which is from the movie. He's got like the, the break sort of in the costume because that that's like a, a nod to his old classic costume with like the H sort of, you know, pattern on his costume. Um, I wish I could have given him the mask type thing, but yeah, that, that was something I didn't have control over. Um, they were like, it was hinted at at some point in there at least. Yeah. Yeah. In the issue that I didn't get to draw, <laughs> he wore the mask with his modern suit. But I mean, I, I, you know, that, that, that happens to me. Like that happens to me a lot when I, when I was drawing, when I drew Thunderbolts the first time, because this Thunderbolts with Hawkeye is the second time I've drawn Thunderbolts. But the first time I drew Thunderbolts, it was when uh, Winter Soldier was leading the team. Um, so to give you an idea of how this happens to me all the time, is like I got I got offered Thunderbolts and I was like, oh, awesome, I get to draw Winter Soldier. Like I just watched like Winter Soldier in the in the you know the movie and I was like amped. And then in the first issue I draw, he shows up in the last panel. Like he doesn't show up in the book at all then in the second issue he shows up but he doesn't there's no action it's just him talking to steve from like a jail cell for a couple of pages so like no action or anything um then with champions they offered me champions and i was like oh champions that's cool he's got cyclops cyclops is my favorite x-man in it they're like oh no he left the team the issue before you start I'm like, oh, why is this what this is always happening to me um so yeah that's sort of how it happens um with with green arrows uh design uh it had the, like i mean you see the costume sort of uh not super clearly on stuff but you do see the costume on the cover um they wanted to kind of keep it similar to the costume he's, he's been wearing but just like you know i could add my flares to it and sort of just you know update a little bit make a couple of changes and stuff and i think it came out really cool um but i mean that's the thing sometimes you'd like you don't necessarily have to do have to do a change um I mean, even when, when I was drawing Uncanny X-Men, Uncanny Avengers, um, Quicksilver had like uh, this, this, this costume that I was like, ah, I, wasn't, I wasn't a big fan of the way it looked. So when I drew it, I added like features to it. I added like finger, fingerless gloves to it. Well, like a, a thumb thing to his, to his shirt. I dropped the collar from a high collar to like a low collar. I gave him a necklace, which was a whole other story I came up with just for myself between him and... <laughs> When I drew Quicksilver and Wanda, I both gave them necklaces, and I've got uh, the one editor at uh, at uh, Marvel knows the story, and she thinks it's a cool story. And I just came up with a story of why they have the, the necklaces and why what's on them and all that stuff, just for myself, you know, just so I can give them some some background. And I changed his costume a little bit, um, but that's sort of what I do. Like I don't want to go too crazy unless I'm allowed to. And I usually like, you know, do the design first, send it to the you know, writer and editor and be like, Hey, so I did this design. I know you didn't ask me, what did you think? And they're like, okay, cool. Um, like for example, um, in Thunderbolts spoilers in the new recent Thunderbolts, when, um, nightmare shows up, uh, and he's like the big bad villain and stuff. I literally designed his new look on the page because I was like, this guy's looked like the same the whole time. It's like update him a little bit, like give him a bit of, you know, just a, just a sprinkle of some, you know, spice and that. And, and uh, I, I literally did like the pencils and I sent them and I'm like, Hey, Oh, by the way, I just redesigned him. And they were like, that looks awesome. Cool. And I'm like, okay, good, good. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> um, there Shoot are some characters. Shot. Yeah, they are. There are some characters where like, so I redesigned Hercules at the end of, um, uh, Avengers, no, no road home. <clears throat> Him, I struggled with because I really wanted to have a lot of these classic kind of looks and stuff, but also like a space, you know, like a, a space adventure kind of look. So I struggled with him for a long time. Uh, when we when we created um, a Snow God for Champions, I think I did like 27 designs because I would do a design then I'd go looking and I'd be like, oh, she looks just like 
this character uh, you know because sometimes i mean you subconsciously you like you've got all these like designs in your head that you're pulling out but sometimes you don't know where you're pulling them out from and by accident they'll end up looking like someone else and then i'll go back and revise it so she took like a while to do but i'm very happy with how she turned out um so yeah that that's sort of how i work with designs i like i go back see where the character came from um uh, uh man uh what's it um uh, spectrum spectrum is she mm -hmm. going by spectrum now yeah <clears throat> in um in thunderbolts like no one told me to like give her a blue jacket and change her design and stuff like that but i was like you know what you know her and um uh blue oh, marvel blue marvel yes like they have like a history and i really loved um al ewing's take on on everything with those guys and i was like oh, i think it'd be quite rad to like break up her her black and white costume a bit and you know kind of have a nod back to their relationship like that's just like even now um there's a character i can't say who in in green arrow and i'm like and i'm like hmm you know i need to i, I want to go and read up on like this guy these characters and just kind of see just in case something happens and also just try and figure out their mannerisms and their body language for when i'm drawing and that kind of stuff yeah and so I'll, I'll go to the comic shop, buy a bunch of their books and sit and like read them before I get to draw them so that I kind of can get in their head. And it's a lot of probably unnecessary work, but it's just like my method, I guess. Yeah, just off the back of that, like going back to the to the Keen Addo stuff, um, I know you probably not allowed to say anything spoilery or anything, but uh, like we've, we've seen all the characters on that cover. There's quite a few of them, I think. I counted 16 altogether. Um, but yeah, what can the fans expect from this new Green Arrow run? I mean, it's been a while sure. since he's headlined um, his own comic book series. So I think fans are quite excited about it. So I, I have like I have an interview I'm doing like on Tuesday, which will probably be released later, which is going to be with uh, Joshua Williamson about Green Arrow. So I can't say, I can't say a lot because I'm doing that with the DC guys. So I can't say I can't say too much because um, obviously that's that's their thing, but what I can say for myself as as a fan of the character and of the Green Arrow family is that like this is a book I would want to read about Green Arrow. You know, it's slight it's slightly different, but it's it's very similar. There's a lot of nods to like classic Green Arrow stuff. Ollie sounds like Ollie to me, like he like one of my favorite versions of Ollie was from the Just League Unlimited series, you know, and I like when Joshua Williamson is writing Green Arrow, that's the voice I hear. Like he's got, you know, those, those type of quips and that type of, you know, kind of dry humor when he says things, which is really like very much like an Oliver Queen kind of thing. Um, I mean, even, even more so than Oliver Queen, like I'm a fan of like my favorite character in DC has always been Nightwing. And a very close second was Roy Harper, right? Um, so, like, one of the first things I said when I started this book was, like, do I get to draw Roy? Um, you know, and then after Roy would be, would be, would be Ollie, obviously, and then, you know, Black Canary. And um, as a fan, like, I, I would love this book. This would be one of my favorite books to read just because, like, there's lots of action. Uh, I'm getting to, like, you know, I get, ex like, sometimes, some days like the best part of my life is, is drawing this book, you know? Um, I think the last time I was this excited about drawing, drawing comic, like nothing against the comics that I've been drawing and stuff. They've all been very exciting and very cool, but there are some that kind of like are just a little bit more exciting and just kind of like bring their creativity out here a bit more, um, was when I drew the Hulk fighting the thing for two comic for two issues. Right. It's like that was that's like a peak highlight for me drawing comics. And this is up there where like, you know, I get you and I'm like every page I'm just pouring my heart into and I am just having so much like so much ridiculous fun drawing this book. I mean that's that's all I can say. I'd I'd love to say more, but like <laughs> it, it, everything is sort of um you know, there's a there's a plan for for when we want to yep. mm -hmm. release um the character design pages and when we're going to release covers and talk about the book more and stuff so they've, they've got like uh dc are very like um methodical on how they want to promote things so like every time i want to post something i just got to check first and see if this is cool because they don't want to spoil stuff and like uh, and that kind of stuff and i can respect all of that and i think it makes it more exciting and i think 
what I've, I've really loved is the the Green Arrow fandom. They've been very, very welcoming to me. Um, and they're just like an awesome group of people that I love just chatting to about the character. Even if I don't talk about the book myself right now, because I can't, um, when, the, when it comes out, I'm just going to be talking about it all the time. Um, but even just like talking about them, about their favorite Green Arrow stories and... You know that kind of stuff like it's it's a lot of fun for me like it's it's, it's you know like least a big part of the job sean we mentioned it off the top but you are our first artist on the show so i want to know your advice to any younger artists anyone who wants to get into the comic book space what would you give them um i think i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of really good advice and stuff but i think the advice i usually give them is to learn to, like being a comic artist is one of those things where if you want to draw comics, you need to be able to draw everything, like literally everything from, from things that don't exist to the most mundane things that exist. I've, I've had to draw people talking inside the United Nations freaking building, which is not very exciting. But if you want to tell a good story, you need to learn how to draw everything, sit and draw every, like every car, draw someone's backyard, draw people sitting at a coffee shop. Um, there's an exercise that I usually tell people that I want to do comics and, I, and want to practice doing stuff. There's an exercise I like to give them. And what I say is um, sit close to it, like by a window in your house and imagine the window is a comic book frame, right? Draw everything that's outside there as it is. Like if there's a car park there, there's trees, there's birds, there's people standing talking or people selling things, whatever. Draw it as it is, the most mundane thing possible, right? And then use that window to tell a story, but then start making up the story. So you draw it as it is at first, because a lot of comic stuff is just sometimes I've had to draw just pages and pages of people talking, right? And you need to you need to find a way to make that exciting, because if it's not exciting for you to draw, it's going to be less exciting for someone to read. Um, so draw whatever you see outside, and then slowly tell the story. Like you know, there's a street, blah 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 blah, blah everything's there. Some your neighbor's house. And then in the next panel, redraw it all the same, but then like maybe draw like a little tentacle coming out of the sewer, you know, and then in the next page, draw it again, but then, you know, draw the whole pavement, like sort of cracking and stuff and like, you know, people running away. And then the next page have like a giant freaking squid coming out of the floor, you know, and then, you know, have a superhero show up and fight and you just tell that story. So you go from the mundane to the fantastical as like an exercise. Like it'll just help you because a lot of artists that want to tell story with want to do comics literally just sit and i was one i was the same when i was in high school and after high school i just draw superheroes like in cool poses being like i want to draw comics you know but that's that's not telling a story um and so you know you kind of need to get used to drawing those things like you know if or even stand on your balcony and then sit and just draw the the skyline of the city because you'll have to draw that a lot you'll have to draw a lot of city skylines in a superhero comic you know um, and i think those are good exercises um the other piece of advice is more of a inspirational one is just like you know don't stop drawing you know you'll, you 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 can look at someone's art and be like i'm gonna stop drawing because i can't draw like that i'm like well if you stop you'll never draw like that but if you carry on one day you'll draw like that and probably even better so never stop drawing no matter what people say to you, don't let people discourage you. Um, go out, make your own comics. That's the best way to, to practice. Go out, if, even if you just like have like one, there, there, there's a, a lot of comics that I used to read constantly on online. Just have like one page and it has like an archive of previous comic strips and just make comic strips. Even if, that, if, that's, your, if that's your jam, make comic strips. Um, you know, build a following, build fans that are going to like your work. If you can't get to Marvel and DC, you need to make them come to you by having a big following, increasing your talent, working on those skills over and over and over again. Make your own comics because when people start talking about your comics online and, you know, like people go to the comic, comic store and they're like, you know, do you have this? Oh, I've never heard of it. And like word spreads like that. Someone somewhere will take notice. People online, your fan, the fans of your work will retweet it. They will share it. They'll talk about it. And that's how people get noticed. There's a lot of editors and talent scouts that are online 
just kind of browsing around and like, they'll be like, oh, this, this book's getting talked about a lot. Let's check this out. And that's sort of how you get noticed. And then some people are just like, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying telling my own stories. I don't need to work for those guys. So, you know, just keep on, keep on tracking, keep on practicing and like, don't give up. It's, it's a passion for a reason. You know, that's, it's, it takes a, it's, it's an, it's not a, I mean, you spend a lot of time drawing, like there's a lot of sacrifice you're going to make, but in the end, like it's, it's just how much do you want it? I mean, I, there were like many times where I wasn't out clubbing with my buddies because I was sitting at home trying to draw my own comic books and stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, it was worth it because I go to a, uh, to a convention and people just tell me how much their work, the work of artists and comic creators means to them. You know, like they are guys that tell stories that resonate with people. I tell, I tell, that's why I tell guys at cons that come in and they're like, oh, you know, I want to have a, I want to have a, I want to, I want to do comic stuff and do art, but I, like, I don't know. And I'm like, dude, you know what? There is a specific story that every single person can tell that will connect with someone else and they can like it's only the way that they do it that it will connect with someone you know and like if if you are a storyteller deep in deep deep inside and you want to tell those stories you as a artist are obligated to share that with everyone cool that's really some great advice um, I'm just going to track back a bit to that cover of The Green Arrow. And uh, out of all of those people on there, there were two characters that really grabbed my attention. Obviously, if you if you aren't allowed to say anything about them, that's cool. Um, but the first one, on the final page of the Dark Crisis series, in that issue seven, um, we see the Suicide Squad or a new Suicide Squad forming. And part of that team is Peacemaker. And Peacemaker finds himself on that Green Arrow cover as well. So I just want to know from you uh, how much of that Peacemaker that you are drawing is in inspired by John Cena's Peacemaker in the DCEU? Um, well, that's the only picture. I can tell you that that's the only picture of Peacemaker I've drawn. I haven't gotten to the part where he shows up in the series yet. I've just finished issue one. Um, I'm, the, I'm on the first four pages of issue two and he hasn't shown up yet. So I can't, I really can't answer that, but I can tell you that uh, out of all the DC movies, um, James Gunn's Suicide Squad and the Peacemaker series are like my favorite DC cinema of the current, like the modern age. I mean, I'm not going to go to Batman 1989 because that, that's, the whole, that's a whole other level of awesome for me. Um, but yeah, the Suicide Squad and John Cena and... Um, uh, piece makeup. I've loved it. I actually do re what rewatches of those uh, regularly while I'm drawing, and I'm just like, I can't wait to see more of uh, James Gunn's uh, DC universe. I'm so excited. So, sure, but I mean, I'm... like, I, we'll 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 see when I get to, when I get to that issue. Yeah, <laughs> Sean, I know you have deadlines coming up, so we will let you get right back to those. Where can people find you on the interwebs, and where can people find your work? Um, well, I mean, like that's that's the thing, right? Um, in I don't use any um, aliases or handles or anything like that. So you can literally just type in uh, Sean Isaacs in Google, and you'll find me everywhere. But um, my Deviant Art account I haven't visited in a very very long time. It's got a lot of my older work. Um, I do have a Tumblr that I kind of pop into once in a while, but uh, a lot of my more personal stuff is on my Instagram, which is also at Sean Isaacs. And then um, I hang out with the fans and chat to other pros and stuff and just retweet art and occasionally have a bit of a rant on Twitter uh, at, <laughs> at, you know, Sean Isaacs on Twitter. Sean, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to come chat with us. We cannot, both of I, us cannot I feel bad, wait. man. I feel bad because I did like a whole buttload of talking and you guys just kind of sat there quietly. That's what, that's what this is about. Talking. It's about you, that's man. You are, yeah. <laughs> it's not about me talking. This, this is, this is, this is, I mean, I'm stuck, I'm stuck indoors in four walls, mm -hmm. just drawing comics. This is the only time I get to be a little bit social. So I do tend to uh, have a bit of verbal diarrhea happen, you know? <laughs> That's it's about you. No one had, no one cares what I have to say. <laughs> uh, everybody cares what you guys have to say, man. <laughs> Sean, thank you again. This is an absolute pleasure. We love to have you on again after the series concludes to talk yes, about it more. Uh, but I know AF and I we will be picking up Green Arrow number one in April the second it gets on the shelf. Uh, do you, let me know what you guys think. I'd love to hear what people's thoughts are. And uh, yeah, once the issue comes out, we can do like a 
recap and stuff. It'll be rad. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll be there at Comic-Con Cape Town waiting for you to get it signed. Oh, dude. <laughs> day. I will be there. I'm trying to organize a bunch of cool things for that. Um, so we'll see. But uh, I'm glad that it, like, it comes out the week before. Like I hope they have stock. But I'm um, amped. I want to do like a big Green Arrow presence there if I can. It'll be rad. Sounds awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome, Sean, dude. thank you again. You can find yeah. me, Damon, on Twitter at Damon Tweet. You can find me on TikTok at Damon Talks Comics T O K S Talks. AF, where can people find you on the interwebs? You can find me on Twitter at AF Parker six four two. I just talk about movies, shows, and football. Actually, mm-hmm. soccer. <laughs> oh, saying so- you don't have to say soccer for me, man. It's okay. <laughs> It's I, have to, I have to cater for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Sean. You have Thanks, been guys. watching this episode of The Comic Corner. Peace.